Hi there, it's Mitch, and before you hear that familiar music, I have a small favor to ask. I've been making this podcast for several months now, and since I've settled in and pretty much gotten the hang of things, I want to know what you think of the show. What do you like about the podcast? What do you not like? I want feedback on whatever you have thoughts about, whether it's the music, the kind of news and content you're hearing, or my silly dad jokes, which I've gotten farther away from, apparently or not, I make the show for you, which means you have a big stake in how it sounds. So please drop me a line at the frequency at vermontpublic.org. You can also find that address in our show notes. Thank you. And now on to the show. From Vermont Public, this is The Frequency. I'm Mitch Wertlieb. It's Monday, February 5th. And here are today's headlines. As Vermont prepares for the total solar eclipse on April 8th, more people are booking short-term rentals for the event. The dynamic pricing company Price Labs scrapes data from Airbnb, Booking.com, and Verbo and says the statewide occupancy rate for the night before the eclipse is currently around 43%. That's more than four times the occupancy rate for the same night last year. To prepare for this influx of visitors, the Vermont Short-Term Rental Alliance is encouraging rental hosts to reach out to local businesses to make sure there will be things for visitors to do. Julie Marks is the organization's executive director. Okay, well, what restaurants can we go to on a Sunday night, on a Monday night in early April? Um, You know, what's going to be open? What other activities can we do with them? (laughs) The Vermont Short-Term Rental Alliance will host a webinar on Monday, February 12th, for homeowners wanting to rent out for the eclipse. The construction of a state-run cannabis testing lab has been delayed several months. Cannabis Control Board Chairman James Pepper was hoping to have the facility online this month, but he says the state's focus on flood recovery has pushed the timetable back. When it's completed, Pepper says it'll be one of the first state cannabis labs in the country. He told lawmakers the lab will allow the state to turn around tests quickly while freeing up space at the two existing commercial labs for private manufacturers. We send our samples there, and of course, we get moved to the front of the line, um, which is helpful for us because we need to act quickly. But it's a detriment to all the other people that um, have products waiting, waiting in line. Pepper says the new testing lab will likely be located in Randolph. Meanwhile, revenues from the retail sale of cannabis in Vermont are exceeding projections. Pepper says sales in the current fiscal year should be roughly $100 million, a total he was not expecting until the marketplace's second full year of operation. Pepper says there are 73 retail stores now open in Vermont and 11 more have applied for a license. And he says annual revenues still have room to grow significantly in coming years. Depending on a few different policy choices the legislature makes, it could be anywhere from kind of the the bare minimum, which I think would be about $120 million, to potentially up, upwards of you know, $190 million. An increase in sales will result in additional funds for after-school programs and youth substance abuse efforts. A family has settled a lawsuit against Green Mountain Union School District, alleging administrators mishandled the harassment of five sisters after one of them was raped. The family's lawyer told VT Digger they settled the suit for $300,000 last month. In 2017, a high school senior reported a fellow student raped her at a party. The perpetrator has since pled guilty to sexual assault in criminal court. The victim's family filed a civil complaint in federal court in 2019, saying Green Mountain Union failed to thoroughly investigate the incident themselves. It also describes harassment the victim and her sisters faced from fellow students after reporting the allegation. An independent investigation found district leaders should have reported several incidents to the police and created a safer environment for the girls, according to the court complaint. The settlement is not an admission of any liability or wrongdoing by the district, according to the agreement. The Vermont House has given strong approval to legislation prohibiting racial discrimination based on hair types, textures, and styles. Morristown Representative Saudia Lamont says it's becoming more common for school officials to tell young female black students that their hairstyles are not appropriate and need to be changed. And she says black adult women also face discrimination for their hair that limits job opportunities. The freedom to take pride in one's appearance in a way, in ways people choose, that feels in alignment with the traits that are associated with their race, improves confidence, self-esteem, dignity, and respect. The measure now goes to the Senate for its consideration. Coming up, 
Farmers and sugar makers in Vermont have had almost no time to recover from a series of devastating storms over the last few seasons. A look at the cumulative effect of relentless bad weather after this. The Frequency is sponsored by Vita. Since 1974, Vita has helped Vermont businesses grow and thrive. From agriculture to energy, startups to family companies, find solutions that fit your business. Visit VEDA.org to start your next chapter today. And the Vermont Lottery, which remains committed to contributing 100% of profits to the Education Fund, providing over $500 million total since 1999. Learn about the Educate and Innovate initiative at vtlottery.com. It's been a tough few seasons for farmers, between the wet summer, a late spring frost, and a series of devastating storms. Again, last month, a major storm swept through Vermont with wind gusts over 80 miles per hour west of the Green Mountains, including in the town of Bristol. Vermont Public's Lexi Krupp talked with farmers and sugar makers there about how damages from storms can pile on top of each other and last for years to come. At 5.30 in the morning in early January, Sarah Heffernan got a call from her dad. He's like, the greenhouse is gone. I was like, what do you mean it's gone? He's like, the greenhouse is just gone. Like, all he could see was, like, with his truck lights. So we didn't really know the extent of the damage. But where the greenhouse once was, was no longer there at all. Sarah lives in Bristol, where she runs a flower farm on her family's property. The night before was really windy. The farm lost power in the middle of the night. And our kids, we have four kids, and they were all up. So, terrible night. I think I fell back asleep about like 4 o'clock in the morning for a little while, and I had this dream something was wrong with the greenhouse. The greenhouse was a big part of Sarah's business. There were actually two of them, and they were big, about 100 feet long by 30 feet wide. They gave her a large area to grow flowers year-round. In the morning, all that was left of one was a mangled skeleton of pipes. I mean, if I were to lose those tulips in there, that's like a huge financial loss and investment and just, it's probably one of the worst days of my life, (laughs) honestly. And the flower farm in Bristol was not the only place hard hit in the windstorm last month. That door doesn't close. They got tweaked by the wind. In Holland, the roof blew off the town garage. Barns lost their roofs in Cambridge and Starksboro. And in lots of these areas, the woods are a mess. It's been going to be like months just (laughs) doing cleanup work. Ryan Lutton is a sugar maker and runs property next to the Heffernance. He went through photos on his phone of what the woods there look like now. There was a perfectly healthy maple tree, like no raw defect in it at all, just snapped it right off like a toothpick. For him, this windstorm felt like deja vu after a major storm last winter, in December of 2022. I just couldn't believe it. Two years in a row, I'm like, this is just unreal. Sickening, devastated, I don't know, just discouraged, but go right in and start cleaning up because... The season's going to be here. And it's not lost on him. These storms are part of a pattern of extreme weather becoming more common. You know, like once in a hundred year storms or something are now happening a little more regularly. Yeah, I think I've seen 50 of them now. (laughs) (laughs) That's Bill Heffernan, Sarah's dad. He's a sugar bush in Starksboro that was also badly damaged last month. And this storm comes after the flooding in July put a spotlight on how extreme weather is impacting Vermont's farming community. The state says farmers reported around $45 million in damage from the floods. And there have been efforts to help farmers in the aftermath. The Agency of Agriculture and private business owners just announced a big fundraising campaign for family farms impacted by extreme weather last year. At the federal level, lawmakers are proposing a new insurance program to better serve small farms. That's after some 70 percent of Vermont farmers that reported damages this summer said they had no crop or livestock insurance. And the New England Organic Farmers Association of Vermont also has a long-running farmer emergency fund for growers impacted by any sort of disaster. 
So in a normal year, we usually see three to five applications come in for various disasters. Last year, we had 250 farms apply for and receive funding from us. Bill Cavanaugh is the farm business advisor there. And he says even with all this help, it's not going to be enough to make people whole. And there is this other weight farmers are dealing with after these sorts of natural disasters. Just a lot of trauma around what happened. I mean, really, for a farmer, when something like this happens, it's it's an impact not just on their land, but on their business, on the place they live, on their employees. And I think folks are really just processing that. Sarah says she still hasn't processed what happened a few weeks ago. And she won't be applying for any emergency aid. What has helped, though, is support from neighbors. I've had people, local and even not local, reaching out to me asking, like, how can they help? And they'll come over here, they'll pull plastic, they will help clean up the mess, they'll help with anything. And, like, it, it's given me a lot of support and encouragement to just keep going. She's still figuring out what to do for the rest of the season. She wants to build some sort of structure to protect her flowers from grazing animals. And she'll plant windbreaks, a row of shrubs, later this year. For now, it looks like most of the tulips she planted in the greenhouse survived. They should still bloom this spring. For Vermont Public, I'm Lexi Krupp. Thanks for listening to The Frequency today. We had additional reporting from Elodie Reed, Bob Kinzel, and Adia Golston. Our executive producer is Kevin Trevelin, and our music is by Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Mitch Wertlieb. Talk to you tomorrow. Black perspectives haven't always been centered in the telling of America's story. Now, we're taking center stage. Introducing NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, a collection of Black-led stories from NPR's podcasts. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get your podcasts.